I would introduce uh, Eric Michael. Eric it comes from the U.S., so I'm happy to have a, a, another another American in our in our circle here. It comes from Illinois, so quite close to me. Uh, we did a mechanical engineering degree at the University of Illinois, um, and has completed now a master's with Dr. Brisbane at, at the ETH, um, and is now pursuing his doctoral work in um, essentially fancy diffusion acquisition. So both acquisition of uh, both readout. Um, in terms of spirals, and then also in diffusion preparation. So with this, um, I would turn it over to Eric. We'll record this and make it available later for those who are not here. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see um, updates on, on, on what you've done here, Eric. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I also want to uh, thank the SCOPE team for inviting me to give this presentation. As Paul said, I'm Eric. I'm a doctoral student at the Institute for Biomedical Engineering in Zurich. And today I'll be highlighting our work using high performance uh, gradients for diffusion experiments, in particular, our experiments using oscillating and motion compensated diffusion gradients. Mm, okay. So, to provide a brief outline of what I'll talk about today, I'll first begin with a very brief introduction on how exactly strong gradients benefit diffusion encoding. And then I'll move on to the two projects which I've worked on, as I mentioned, uh, which are the use of oscillating diffusion gradients for spectral diffusion measurements and the use of motion compensated diffusion gradients for segmented acquisitions. Now, to first explain how exactly gradient strength benefits diffusion encoding, I have here. Um, a general equation for exponential decay, which results uh, due to the application of diffusion gradients. Um, and it is that we have the logarithm of the diffusion weighted signal relative to the unweighted signal equaling minus D, the diffusivity times this integral over the diffusion encoding duration of Q squared of T. Now, the first thing to note is that Q of T is equal to gamma times the integral of the gradient, uh, which as you can all please see is equivalent to the definition for K of T um, Q of T is just instead the formalism that's used for gradient encoding done for the purpose of diffusion. I also show here an example pulse gradient sequence. Um, and a convention that I use here is that I show the effective gradients, which account for the effect of the 180 degree RF pulse. And then I show the Q of T waveform for the sequence as well, which is trapezoidal. Now, from this equation for exp with exponential decay, this integral of Q squared is actually equal to um, our B value, which quantifies our diffusion encoding strength. Now to show how exactly this looks, here's our Q squared waveform where this yellow area um, is our B value. And what I hope is clear from these equations is that scaling in G corresponds to equivalent scaling in Q and that scaling to the second power um, in Q squared and therefore our B value. So the B value is proportional to the gradient amplitude squared um, which indicates that the gradient strength dictates our diffusion encoding efficiency. That is, by, by using stronger gradients, we achieve more B value per unit time. Now, to illustrate how exactly strong gradients can be used, um, I have here, again, a standard pulsed pair of gradients. And if we were to instead try to do this with uh, stronger gradients, one option we would have would be to achieve the same B value in a shorter time. That is because we have stronger gradients, we go further out in Q space, and therefore we can afford less time between the gradient pulses to uh, accumulate the same area in Q squared. Um, another option we have would be to just keep the sequence timing as it is and aim for a higher B value by scaling up the gradient amplitudes. That is again, because we go further out in Q space and overall just have a greater integral of Q squared over the same duration. Now, given these two primary use cases of using strong gradients in diffusion experiments, it can generally be said that we have an increased accessible measurement space. Um, and to be more specific, by using strong gradients, we could perform measurements that may have otherwise been infeasible because of having too long of an echo time or uh, too little diffusion sensitization. And what this allows is uh, we can better understand brain structure and microstructure on the one hand, we could perform tractographies based on more sensitive diffusion tensor measurements, or we can derive microstructural properties from um, diffusion encoding methods, which are intrinsically inefficient and may be infeasible when not using strong gradients. More importantly, though, what this increased measurement space allows us is an increased 
capacity to detect and discover biomarkers based on diffusion restrictions. Overall, there's quite some promise in using strong gradients in diffusion experiments. And this explains why there has been quite some effort in recent years using strong gradients um, to explore these possibilities in, in the realm of diffusion. Um, now, given this brief introduction, I'll now move on to the first project I've worked on using our high performance gradient system. And that is, again, our use of oscillating diffusion gradients and spectral diffusion measurements. So to first motivate why exactly we would like to use oscillating gradients, it's important to consider that the diffusivity measured in a diffusion experiment depends on the time over which we probe diffusion, that is the diffusion time. And the reason for this is that as more time passes, um, diffusing molecules will have had more time to experience their restrictions, thereby having their motion uh, limited. And ultimately, we would like to understand this relationship between diffusivity and diffusion time. Um, as it may reveal some insight into the characteristic microstructural length scales, but achieving short diffusion times is rather hard with pulse gradients. Um, and this is where oscillating gradients come into play. They're essentially repetitions of short diffusion time intervals of pulse gradients. Um, and well, to explain how exactly this is the case, I have here um, a pulse gradient sequence as well as an oscillating gradient sequence below. And if we look at the pulse gradient sequence first, which has spacing between the pulses given by big delta, we can see that we ultimately just have a single encoding period uh, with diffusion time approximately equal to this big delta. Now in the oscillating gradient case, on the other hand, um, where we have uh, a period given by one over the oscillation frequency, we have multiple encoding periods where an encoding period is given by equal positive and negative gradient areas. And the effective diffusion time in this case is less than or equal to a quarter of a period, depending on how exactly uh, you, you design your shape. Um, now, ultimately with, with pulse gradients, we could achieve a similarly short diffusion time, but doing so would not leave us uh, with enough or high enough of a B value. So we would have to repeat the pulse gradient, uh, I guess, repetition multiple times in order to achieve some higher B value, which is, ultimately what we are doing effectively with an oscillating gradient sequence. It's also worth noting that the diffusion time is a construct which was um, designed to intuitively describe pulse gradients, but this intuition sort of falls apart with oscillating gradients where we have a more complex modulation um, structure. So when using oscillating gradients, it then becomes um, more intuitive to consider a different paradigm where we consider the spectral power of our diffusion gradients. And this allows us to characterize the spectral dependence of a diffusivity and uh, rather the diffusion spectrum D of omega. Now to explain how exactly D of omega can look, it's first and so, and, uh, important to consider that similar to the dependence on diffusion time, the dependence of diffusivity on diffusion frequency uh, depends on restrictions present in the microstructural environment and on properties such as geometry and um, characteristic length scales. Something else I will note is that this uh, frequency omega corresponds to a temporal observation frequency and should be understood as being inversely proportional to a diffusion time. Now, the two key example cases of for which it's relevant to show this diffusion spectrum would be free and restricted diffusion, where um, in free diffusion, there are no obstacles to the Brownian motion and we have constant diffusivity with respect to frequency. On the other hand, where there are restrictions to the Brownian motion, um, we have diffusivity, which increases with increasing frequency. And the way this can be understood is that uh, for lower frequencies, which corresponds to longer diffusion times, Again, more of the molecules will have experienced restrictions, therefore having their motion limited, which would be characterized by a lower diffusivity. On the other hand, um, higher frequencies corresponds to shorter diffusion times where fewer of the molecules will have experienced restrictions and therefore have a lower diffusivity or um, a higher diffusivity. Um, and then the highest frequency case, which corresponds to well, the shortest possible diffusion time, nothing will have experienced restrictions and um, the diffusivity will be that of the medium, which is higher than in the other two cases. Now, given that this diffusion spectrum has um, properties and a shape, which we would like to measure, it's important then to see how this measurement um, 
or I guess how exactly this diffusion spectrum can be inferred from an MR measurement. So the attenuation in the spectral domain, which I won't exactly derive, uh, can be uh, given by the logarithm of the relative signal being equal to the integral over frequencies of q of omega squared times d of omega. Now, this quantity d of omega is again the diffusion spectrum, and q of omega squared is ultimately our encoding spectrum or probing function, which decides at which frequencies we will be measuring diffusion. And it's worth noting that q of omega squared is equal to the Fourier transform squared of, of q of t. So to sort of interpret this equation uh, for the exponential decay, we have that the resultant signal loss due to the application of diffusion gradients depends on the diffusivity at the frequencies encoded by our encoding spectrum, and that our encoding spectrum is a function of the diffusion gradients that we apply, or more specifically, um, the Q of T of these diffusion gradients. So for the example encoding spectrum, I show here on the right in green, which is centered at zero frequency. This can be achieved by using uh, pulse gradients, which have, again, a trapezoidal Q of T waveform. On the other hand, if we use oscillating gradients, um, we have an oscillating Q of T, and therefore a spectral peak that is away from zero. Um, now, given that for a given measurement, we can um, say that this corresponds to some given frequency. We would like to design multiple diffusion gradient sequences such that each of them has a different uh, frequency encoding so that we can you know, measure different frequencies. Um, ideally, we would like to measure this diffusion spectrum exactly at our encoding frequencies with direct delta functions. Of course, this isn't uh, possible just because our uh, diffusion gradient waveforms are limited in time, so our actual encodings rather have a finite bandwidth. Um, but importantly, to reiterate what I mentioned on the previous slide, the use of standard pulse gradients amounts to a zero hertz measurement, whereas um, the use of oscillating gradients corresponds to a non-zero frequency measurement. And again, the reason for this is that because we must have oscillations in Q of T at the desired frequency, such that the Fourier domain of Q of T has these frequencies. Now, one of the main drawbacks of using oscillating gradients is that they are an intrinsically inefficient form of diffusion encoding. Um, and the reason for this well, is exactly that we have these oscillations. And to illustrate this, um, well, it's best to compare to the pulse gradient case where we don't have oscillations. And on the left-hand side, we have a Q of T, which oscillates about zero. And on the right-hand side, we have Q of T, which is um, just a constant positive value in this trapezoid. Now we must look at Q of T or Q squared ultimately. And in the pulse gradient case, uh, because we don't have any oscillations in Q, we just have a constant positive area. Whereas in the oscillating gradient case in Q squared, we have uh, well, ultimately multiple lobes and less accumulated area overall due to these oscillations. And this is exactly the, the mechanism for the encoding inefficiency. And it is worth noting that it becomes worse at higher frequencies, uh, which is something I'll explain more about later. And it's also worth noting that um, using strong gradients for um, oscillating gradients would uh, enable you to achieve a higher B value uh, simply by keeping the sequence timing as it is, um, and then accumulating a greater integral of, of Q squared. Ultimately, there, there wouldn't be much value in um, trying to achieve uh, such a B value in, in a shorter time. Now, despite this encoding inefficiency, there has of course still been great interest in quantifying D of omega. Um, and, and that is because it may reveal some, some uh, microstructural properties, which we may not otherwise be able to infer. And it was recently de uh, discovered that diffusivity in white and gray matter in the human brain um, has a frequency response, which corresponds to this um, power law model, where the exponent of this power law model was found to be 0 0.5 and 1 in different studies, which corresponds to a square root dependence on frequency and a linear dependence on frequency, respectively. Ultimately, though, in the range of diffusivities and frequencies, which we measured, uh, these two are very similar. Um, but in any case, it's worth noting that 
uh, well, they correspond well to this general characterization of restricted diffusion and that we have increasing diffusivity with increasing frequency. Um, also, this model is corroborated by microstructural diffusion simulations, um, and it represents short range disorder in one or two dimensions, depending on the exponent. Now, as, as a bigger picture, the significance of, of having this model is that it offers a novel biophysical contrast mechanism. And that is because we now have these additional spectral measures, which may allow us to distinguish tissues or uh, know about their health. And in particular, this um, parameter lambda in the diffusion dispersion model uh, has been proposed as a clinical metric where differences in lambda would correspond to differences in the amount of disorder. Um, now, you know, along with this progress in using oscillating gradient or oscillating diffusion gradients, there are still some key limitations. As I mentioned before, there is generally low sensitivity due to the intrinsically inefficient encoding. And this also corresponds to long echo times because ultimately, no matter which frequency we would like to sample, we have to perform some number of oscillations. Another general limitation is that there is relatively weak spectral selectivity. And this is particularly the case for one plus one period oscillating gradient waveforms. And to be more specific, this is um, a waveform where there's a single period of oscillation on either side of the 180 degree RF pulse. And in this case, there are particularly strong side lobes. This can be seen here where I have example encoding spectra for representative one plus one and then two plus two period waveforms where on the left-hand side with fewer periods, we have a wider bandwidth at the peak frequency and greater spectral energy away from this peak frequency. Ultimately, in, in terms of the spectral selectivity, it would be attractive to um, sample more periods, but this comes at the expense of echo time, um, which, for example, sampling lower frequencies would uh, will be too prohibitive to use more than one frequency or more than one oscillation on either side of the RF pulse. So, it, um, in light of these limitations, we had the objective of developing a generally high performance OGSE implementation for measuring diffusion dispersion with better sensitivity. Now, the first thing we worked on was developing oscillating gradient shapes. Um, and to show exactly what our changes, I show here first an original one plus one period oscillating gradient waveform as well as, as, well as Q of T and, and Q squared. And our um, our modification is, is rather simple. It's that we, we try to fill the gap between um, the oscillating gradient pulses. Typically, it's equal to half a period, and now we've shortened it to the shortest time that's possible in order to fit in the 180-degree RF pulse, thereby eliminating some dead time. Now, to see what exactly this does, um, in, in Q of T, what we have is an improved periodicity. That's because there's a shorter disruption in the middle. And uh, for the gap-filled case, Q of T uh, just looks much more highly regular, like a um, more constant triangular waveform. And what this, uh, the implication this has in Q squared is that because we no longer remain at Q equals zero in between the oscillating or the, the two oscillations, we have an extra lobe in Q squared. And this then corresponds to a higher B value. Now, both of these properties can also be seen in the spectral domain, where on the one hand, due to the improved periodicity in Q of T, we have a higher energy concentration in the lobe at the peak frequency, and this is by about 40%. Um, on the other hand, with the higher B value, we have more spectral energy overall, or just a, a higher integral, and this is by around 25%. Now, our implementation, um, in addition to using the improved oscillating gradient shapes. We've used, as I mentioned, our high performance gradient system, which allows us to achieve uh, higher B values and or higher frequencies. Um, now on the one hand, higher B values would give us better sensitivity to diffusion, whereas higher frequencies would give us better sensitivity to changes in diffusivity with frequency because um, a higher frequency would give us a greater difference in diffusivity with respect to zero frequency. Um, the final part of our implementation was using spiral readouts, which enabled us to shorten the echo time. Um, it's, it's worth noting that this was particularly enabled by having a field monitoring setup, uh, which is practically necessary for 
I'm reconstructing spiral image as well. And this allowed us a reduction of around 20 milliseconds in the echo time. Now, in addition to just simply developing this implementation, we also uh, sought to address uh, the question, um, or rather to assess the, the trade-off between B value and maximum frequency and a multi-frequency measurement of the diffusion spectrum. And uh, to reiterate a point from a previous slide, the B value and the sampling frequency come at the expense of one another for an, a fixed encoding duration. And well, to, to better explain this trade-off or why we're interested in it, it's important to consider that when performing a multi-frequency diffusion acquisition, uh, we would like to keep the B value fixed across all frequencies. Now this can easily be done by using our highest available gradient amplitude at our highest frequency and matching this B value at the lower frequencies by using lower gradient amplitudes. Um, and, and then, you know, considering this, what follows is that given that we have a gradient amplitude limit and a sort of fixed encoding duration, the choice of our sampling frequency indeed dictates the highest B value that can be used. On the one hand, it may be attractive to sample higher frequencies just to characterize this relationship over a greater range, but doing so comes at the expense of B value, which uh, will maybe be prohibitive ultimately. And just to also visualize this trade-off again, on the left-hand side, I have a 50 Hertz waveform, uh, which is a higher frequency than the waveform I show on the right-hand side, which is 30 Hertz. Um, ultimately, these two are the same duration and have the same gradient amplitude. The main takeaway here is that on the right-hand side, um, because we have fewer oscillations in Q of T, our, our Q squared away from ultimately has a greater integral than on the left-hand side. And uh, again, this is the, the trade-off between B value and, and your choice of frequency. Now, to explain the experiments that we performed, we scanned some volunteers in vivo using oscillating and pulse gradient DTI sequences, where we had gradient amplitudes up to 200 millitesla per meter and so it's up to 600 tesla per meter per second using, as I mentioned, spiral readouts. We performed multiple frequency um, diffusion measurements at three different B values of 300, 500, and 1,000 seconds per millimeter squared with maximum frequencies of 125, 100, and 75 hertz, respectively. Now we performed field monitoring after our scans, and this data informed higher order reconstructions. and we then computed mean diffusivity maps to which we could fit the diffusion dispersion power law model to each voxel and then separately for each B value as well, where the model is shown here. Uh, it's identical to the one I showed before um, with, uh, well, I guess the main difference that we have uh, chosen an exponent of 0 0.5 and ultimately we're interested in this parameter lambda, which is our diffusion dispersion rate. Now, after performing the in vivo me measurements, uh, we wanted to evaluate the expected benefits of um, measuring diffusion dispersion, which with each uh, B value and maximum frequency pairing um, by, by replicating the, the measurement process. So for each B value and frequency combination, we simulated measurements by sampling diffusivities from a Gaussian distribution where the mean was primarily frequency dependent and based on our in vivo data and the standard deviation is primarily B value dependent and given by this diffusion to noise ratio formulation shown here where um, we know all the parameters. And ultimately um, for a set of simulated measurements at a given B value that is across all frequencies, we could fit the diffusion dispersion model and we could do this a large number of times um, such that we have the distribution of, of lambda in the presence of noise uh, from which we could compute the mean and standard deviation to infer the dispersion to noise ratio. And then we could do this separately for um, you know, all the sets of simulated measurements for different B values and maximum frequency pairings and also the respective intermediate frequencies. Um, and this would allow us to know the dependence of the dispersion to noise ratio um, on these choice of parameters. Now, moving on to some of our results. In this slide, I show here a representative imaging slice and the mean diffusivity maps that we acquired across all frequencies and B values that we applied. Now, the main thing to note is that we have increasing mean diffusivity with 
increasing beat, uh, increasing frequency going from left to right, and with decreasing B value going from the bottom up. Now, this trend can ultimately more easily be seen in terms of a plot where I show for um, some various white matter regions, the um, diffusivity versus frequency, um, and the diffusion dispersion model fitted uh, separately for each B value. And ultimately, the same trends that I just mentioned can be seen that we have diffusivity increasing with frequency and with decreasing B value. And also the dispersion rates are, are apparently the same in all cases across B values. Another thing worth noting in the images on the left is that we have a higher diffusion to noise ratio at higher B values. And this is given by in the bottom row of images, uh, we have the best sort of local homogeneity. Um, now fitting this diffusion dispersion power law model voxel wise resulted in these images here where in different rows, I show a representative slice for different volunteers and in different columns, um, these images for um, different B values and corresponding um, maximum frequencies and intermediate frequencies. Now, the main thing to note in these images is that the quality of the diffusion dispersion maps improves as we go from left to right, that is with increasing B value. And this is given by the fact that in the rightmost column, we have fewer regions of spurious um, dispersion values as well as better local homogeneity. And this result is supported by our Monte Carlo simulations where again, we estimated the SNR of measuring the diffusion dispersion rate for different B values and uh, frequency combinations by performing simulated measurements. Um, so what this figure shows us here is that we have improving dispersion to noise ratio with increasing B value and uh, greater gains in dispersion to noise ratio efficiency than in just dispersion to noise ratio. And the reason for this is that at higher B values, uh, we sample fewer frequencies, um, ultimately because the higher frequency or the, the maximum frequency is the lowest. Um, and therefore, you know, with a higher B value, uh, it required less time to perform these measurements. What these uh, findings represent overall is that sampling higher and more frequencies uh, is, is not compensated for the fact that we have lower diffusion to noise ratio um, at lower B values. So to summarize this part of my presentation, we found that there is better sensitivity to measuring the diffusion dispersion rate and multi-frequency acquisitions when done at higher B values and lower maximum frequencies. And again, this is because we lose too much diffusion to noise ratio at lower B values, and it's not overcome by uh, the fact that we sample more and greater frequencies. Now, going to higher B values might also be possible, but doing so would introduce diffusion kurtosis effects, which would need to be accounted for, um, whereas going to higher frequencies would be limited by peripheral nerve simulation. It's worth noting that this uh, finding opposes the traditional desire to push the frequency limit. We find rather that uh, for the sake of sensitivity, it's, it's best to favor B value over frequency. And in general, um, what these measurements represent is a more sensitive way to uh, measure the diffusion spectrum. And overall, this provides us with uh, an inability to further explore brain microstructure. And uh, with that, I'll now move on to the final part of my presentation about using motion compensated diffusion gradients and segmented acquisitions. So the main motivation for performing segmented diffusion acquisitions is to achieve higher resolution, less blurring, and fewer distortions than in single shot acquisitions. Um, and it has been shown in particular by using higher imaging resolution that uh, clinical decision-making can be improved. Um, and, and generally, we can also further our understanding of, of brain microstructure. Um, despite these promises, uh, multi-shot DWI is limited by shot-to-shot -shot phase variability, which results in artifacts, and it has two main causes. The first being that living subjects involuntarily move. Um, the such motion may be very slight, like on the micron or tens of micron level, but there is indeed non-zero velocity and acceleration still. And ultimately, typical diffusion sensitization schemes are sensitive to this motion and that they have non-zero gradient moments. Uh, so putting these together 
Um, if we consider that the phase accrual during the application of gradients depends on the time dependence of both the gradients and position, um, we have that the phase resulting from involuntary motion during the diffusion encoding period is given by moments of the diffusion gradients multiplied by equivalent order derivatives of this motion. Now, the zeroth order moment is null practically for free uh, when applying diffusion weighting, and that's because we must um, satisfy the spin echo condition. However, first and um, second order, and well, even higher order moments for that matter, are typically not nulled, and this results in motion-dependent phase accrual. And if we consider that across uh, shots of a interleaved acquisition, we would have variable motion states, and therefore different values of uh, this phase accrual, then this ultimately results in the problematic corrupted images. Now, this shot-to-shot -shot phase variability is typically handled on the reconstruction side, where the per-shot phase variations are estimated and then corrected for, or just corrected for directly in a less, less explicit manner. Um, something else which ultimately we are interested in here is to try to suppress the phase variability directly at the source. And what this amounts to is using diffusion gradient waveforms, uh, which have nulled moments, which would hopefully um, reduce the phase variability. And this process overall, we can call motion compensation. And just to be very clear, what it means is that nulling up through the nth order moment of the diffusion gradients would eliminate phase accrual for up to the nth order derivative of, of motion. And to provide an example of how this might be, I show here a double bipolar pulse, which achieves first order compensation um, as given by the plot on the left, uh, which represents M1 and ends at zero. In this case, the phase accrual would no longer depend on velocity, uh, but just acceleration and higher order uh, derivatives. Now, the main problem with using motion compensated gradients, similar to using oscillating gradients, is that it's an intrinsically inefficient form of encoding. And well, this can be explained, uh, for example, in the first order compensation case, where because we must achieve uh, or reach the spin echo condition, it turns out that the first order moment is equal to negative one times the integral of uh, Q of T. And what this implies is that for M1 nulling, we must uh, null the integral of, of Q of T. And this is done by the double bipolar pulse. Um, as shown here in the center plot, we have Q of T again, which has um, equal and opposite triangular areas. And uh, this integral of Q of T refocuses to zero as desired. But if we compare it to a pulse gradient case with the same amplitude and timing otherwise, um, ultimately the, the accumulation in of, of the integral in Q squared is much lower in the first order compensated case just because of uh, this old oscillation in Q of T. And uh, this disadvantage becomes even worse as we increase the order of motion compensation because ultimately more zero crossings will be required in Q of T because we must null higher order integrals of Q of T. And this would then result in a lower B value. So in this case, by using strong gradients, we would take um, up for the, the first method, which I mentioned before, which would be aiming for a certain B value and doing so um, in, in less time, basically using stronger gradients and achieving a B value of say 1000 with first or second order compensation would leave us a too long of an echo time, uh, but doing so with stronger gradients um, suddenly becomes well, much more feasible. Um, so, and to, to, to be clear, the, the, the goal here of, of our experiments would be to uh, use our high performance gradients in order to uh, you know, perform uh, motion compensated diffusion sensitization, which should suppress shot to shot phase variability and hopefully allow us to achieve artifact free image reconstructions. And we also focused on the use of spirals because with respect to EPI, they have um, higher SNR and readout efficiency. Now, the, the gradient system that we use is the same as the one that I mentioned before. And in terms of our diffusion gradients, we use three different forms, each achieving a B value of 1,000 seconds per millimeter squared. The first being the typical um, pulse gradients, which are un uncompensated and M0 nulled. We also then use 
um, M0 and M1 node and M0, M1, M2 node, which are first order compensated and first and second order compensated respectively. These gradient waveforms are shown here on the right, where again, the sensitive sensitization efficiency reduces as we go down. And this explains why um, the echo times listed on the left-hand side uh, per order of motion compensation um, increase with increasing motion compensation just because of this inefficiency. Now, in terms of our acquisitions, we performed uh, three direction DWIs. First, with uh, single shot spirals and 15 repetitions, each achieving two millimeter resolution. This would allow us to uh, understand and quantify the phase variability across repetitions, which we assume would be equivalent to what we experience in a multi shot acquisition. And then we also performed the multi shot acquisitions using three shot spirals, four repetitions each, um, achieving a higher resolution. And this would allow us to see whether the expected reduction in phase variability when using motion compensation would yield um, unproblematic images. And again, we performed higher order reconstructions based on our field monitoring data. Now to show the, the first results here from these experiments, um, this figure here generally shows phase variability across repetitions of our single shot acquisitions. So what I'll say is that um, in this figure, the same imaging slice is just shown for a bunch of different uh, acquisitions and repetitions generally. And the figure is broken up into three parts, A, B, and C, where in each part we show images for different axes of diffusion encoding. And in each part, there are four columns where in each column a phase difference map is shown with respect to the first repetition for repetitions two through five. And in different rows, we have um, different orders of, of motion compensation. Now, in viewing the images here, ultimately, we are looking at the phase variability um, column by column in each part where greater changes in color represent more phase variability. And uh, bearing this in mind, what we can see is that we have the strongest phase variability in the first row of images, which is um, uncompensated diffusion gradients. And in particular, this is seen in the rightmost column with the z-axis z -axis diffusion encoding. Um, However, these phase fluctuations reduce as we increase the order of, of motion compensation, where in the bottom row with first and second order, uh, we have the most steady uh, phase. Now, this image here has um, a similar takeaway to what I showed on the previous slide, where instead of showing directly the um, repetition to repetition phase variations, this is just the standard deviation of the phase variations over all repetitions for um, a certain imaging slice. And again, in different columns, we have uh, different directions of diffusion gradients in different rows, different orders of motion compensation. Now, what we can see again here is that with no compensation in the top row, we have the greatest phase variability. Another thing worth noting is that the phase variability maps have flatter spatial profiles in the presence of motion compensation. And this indicates that the motion compensation is robust to non-rigid motion. Uh, which we think explains the um, inhomogeneous phase variability of the top row of images likely due to cardiac pulsation. And also to make a quantitative comparison, um, we've taken the average of this center deviation of, of the phase variability um, over the entire imaging volume um, and also over both volunteers. And well, to make a comparison, for second order relative to no compensation, we had a, a nearly 60% reduction in the phase variability for X and Y axis diffusion encoding and for Z axis diffusion encoding, a reduction of more than 80%. <clears throat> it's also worth noting that the phase variability and uh, for Z axis diffusion encoding with first and second order compensation is no longer anomalously higher than um, in the other two directions, which indicates that the motion compensation is effective in all directions. Uh, this isn't exactly the case for first order compensation alone, where we st still have um, phase variability of around 22 degrees, which as I was shown on the next slide was not necessarily sufficient. So in this image, I have uh, ultimately a, a same figure to that shown two slides ago, where instead of showing phase, different map, phase difference maps, um, I show raw magnitude reconstructed images for our multi-shot acquisitions. 
Now, um, in the first row of images, which again is uncompensated, we can see that we have uh, prevalent artifacts in the form of signal dropout, and especially for z-axis diffusion encoding, which corresponds well to this um, case having um, the, the very heightened phase variability across repetitions. Now with first compensation, first order compensation alone, the signal dropout is largely avoided, um, except for one case for z-axis diffusion encoding, which um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, corresponds to the fact that this phase variability of around 22 degrees was not exactly enough. Um, however, using first and second order compensation yielded artifact-free images for every repetition in every diffusion direction, um, indicating that this uh, suppression of the phase variability was sufficient. And it's worth noting that it wasn't complete. There was still a phase variability of around uh, 10 degrees, um, give or take, depending on the direction. And uh, this apparently was okay for reconstructing artifact for the images. Now to conclude uh, this final part of my presentation, we found that using first and second order motion compensated diffusion gradients allowed us to um, acquire consistent artifact free uh, multi-shot spiral images. And it's also worth noting that our use of high performance gradients and spiral readouts allowed us to perform these acquisitions relatively efficiently and with a shorter echo times than might have otherwise been possible. Um, also, it, it's worth noting that because of the suppressed shot-to-shot -shot phase variability, we had phase variability which was low enough that we no longer required um, the correction uh, in a computationally expensive reconstruction algorithm. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions now. Eric, thanks so much. Um, I think if, if anyone else is generating a question, I'll just read off what, what I was thinking of um, during the talk is you, you're, you're building this whole framework of adding additional diffusion encoding um, to provide additional information. Do you, do you already have the kind of analytic expression for here's what you can achieve given a certain scanner specifications? Um, uh, I, I guess, do you mean if I have some sort of formula, which would, you know, let us know what B value can achieve for a certain. Exactly. Yeah, this is actually, um, yeah, it, it's very much analytical in terms of the B value mm -hmm. you can achieve for a given gradient waveform and, and amplitude um, and frequency and whatnot. Um, and, and yeah, this is something that you we're well aware of. Okay. And as a follow-up to that, do you have a statement of, you know, it's either, yes it is or no it's not worth pursuing this unless you have a gradient of a certain performance capability um so ultimately we've sought out a b value of 1000 which is what's typically used in the brain and um with this then i guess i'll refer specifically to our motion compensated gradients but to mm -hmm. achieve a b value of 1000 with second order compensation required an echo time of 38 milliseconds um however I suppose uh, getting a certain B value isn't always necessary. Um, mm -hmm. For example, at the last ISM REM, there was an abstract where they also use motion compensated diffusion gradients um, in a similar manner to us. And they achieved a B value of 450, but they also saw um, similar advantages in the suppressed phase variability and the ability to reconstruct artifact free mm -hmm. images. So um, while on the one, on one hand, I could you know, argue that, you know, let's say we're more competitive in terms of B value and echo mm -hmm. time, I still think it's very much feasible to do this um, without a high performance gradient system. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll push that, you know, you, you kind of abstract yourself from, from the work that, that you're currently doing and say, what is the information that, that we're looking for? You, know, you, you brought that in in your introduction and can, can anyone go out and do this on their Prisma or even their Achiva and, and get the information that, that they would need? And just to be clear, by, by information, are you referring to this, uh, you know, microstructural information? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, in, in principle, um, the use of strong gradients only allows right. you to achieve this with better sensitivity. That is like a right. reduction of the echo time. Um, now, honestly, I, I, I'm not sure if I could say in a practical sense whether this is impossible mm -hmm. for it let's say a system which doesn't have 
strong gradients. Um, I would say it still probably is possible. It would just require a lot more averaging and um, maybe mm -hmm. infeasible in, in that sense, just due to the extra acquisition time. Sure, and, th and then you're more susceptible to motion from different acquisitions, not just between shots, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and then as a follow-up to that, um, I, I also just typed out, I, I suppose, as you set an SNR limit for your images, you say, you know, this is something I want to achieve. Um, can you already think about what is achievable with EPI? You know, some people are just dead set against spiral for whatever reason. Can you also set this achievable limit in terms of EPI versus spiral and really just explicitly show here's what you gain? Um, yes. So, well, it's also worth noting that, um, well, at least in our experience, the use of EPIs for these multi shot acquisitions has been a bit more problematic. Um, ultimately, it turns out that a certain level of phase variability um, is like basically could result in a sort of uh, let's say an artifact in EPI, whereas it's something that's uh, beneath the level of detection when when using spirals. So, so mm. I guess for this matter alone, uh, well, ultimately we've had more difficulty using EPIs um, than spirals, and, and this is on top of the fact that, of course, you have better SNR with with spirals. So, in, in more ways than one, uh, yeah, we find that spirals are are very favorable for this application okay. of multi-shot imaging. Yeah, that's not something I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Um, if I'll, I'll, I'll add another, oh, there's a, there's a question from David Feinberg in the chat. Um, can you comment on the impact of slew rate, not just achievable gradient strength on the outcome of this? Um, yes. So, um, well, I, I guess I can break it down into the, the two, um, applications that I've been working with. So, um, yes, yeah, slew rates in particular would, would limit the achievable frequency and oscillating gradient measurements. Um, but um, ultimately, because we found that we ought to sacrifice um, well, well frequency rather than B value, um, the, yeah, having a lower slew rate wouldn't be that damaging. I mean, it does result in a, a lower B value, but ultimately, as long as you have a, a high enough slew rate to reach your given amplitude, um, and say a, a quarter of a period of the oscillating gradient waveform, then you don't actually have a problem. You can still do it. Um, on the other hand, um, yeah, I, I don't think the motion compensated diffusion gradient shapes are particularly slew rate limited um, just because they're not oscillating rapidly enough. Again, it would lead to a lower B value, but um, I, I wouldn't say it makes um, you know performing these sequences any less feasible. Do you get do you get hit on the readout module side? With the slew rate limitations? Uh, yes, actually, I think our trajectories are generally designed in house. And um, yeah, I think we're generally pinned to the maximum slew rate. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I guess on that side, um, you would require a longer time for, for the readout, but it wouldn't exactly extend the echo time. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, it's another slight disadvantage, but um, I still think the, the spiral readouts can be done, you know, relatively quickly, even with the lower slew rate. Um, okay. And that wouldn't be the key limitation. So as you think about both modules, both the diffusion preparation and the readout, if you have an achievable, I mean, whole body gradient achievable slew rates are really limited to what, maybe 150 or 170, if you have a really well-designed coil for, for PNS. So if, if you think about that limit, you know, just if you can do in your head, you know, what's your limitations? That's that's really what we're talking about compared to head gradient systems. Yeah, I, I suppose in this case, um, I, I mean, so yeah, I, my guess is the key limitation would just be the, the readout duration. Um, and mm. I mean, I could say, for example, our, our ability to reconstruct spirals uh, requires that you know, we can monitor the entire spiral sequence with, with our, our mm. scope system. Um, however, once this becomes too long, then then ultimately um, the, the probe lifetime might not be long enough. Um, and um, which, yeah, may make it difficult, more difficult with, with a lower slew rate. Mm. Um, but, but ultimately th there's still a trade-off to be made in terms of the resolution you want to achieve um, and the readout duration, right? So mm. if you have, 
um, if, if you're not aiming for as high of a resolution, or for example, uh, you can uh, do under sampling, then, then the readout duration mm. um, will not be as problematic and uh, you can still perform the acquisitions mm. fine. So I think probably you have to sacrifice on some of these parameters, um, but ultimately it, it shouldn't you know, disallow you from, from performing um, such measurements. Thanks. And then one uh, one more question from uh, from David. Uh, he's commenting that the second order, uh, I think, uh, the second order uh, motion compensation gradient didn't seem to have a huge effect. Um, do you think the single, the, the velocity compensation can be sufficient? Um. Well, I guess in, in some sense it kind of depends on uh, the, the reliability you're going for. So. Um, in the example images I shown, that was for you know a single imaging slice, um, where you know one of the four repetitions, the the phase variability was apparently too high to to reconstruct an artifact free image. Um, now, over over all the slices of of all of our volunteers, I think we had something like let's say a five percent failure rate of, of achieving a good image reconstruction. Hmm. Um, and uh, of course, it'd be interesting to see how, how this varies um, or if this changes for, for a different you know, MR system generally. But um, uh, I guess what it seems is that, yeah, you can expect to have just like a lower rate of successful reconstructions with first order compensation. Um, and because in our case specifically, it was only three extra milliseconds of echo time, there was hmm. basically no reason to um, not add the second order compensation. Um, yeah, I guess ultimately it depends on, um, you know, how, how you favor mm -hmm. these, these different things. But as long as um, it doesn't really damage the, the echo time, which generally it shouldn't increase it by way too much, then mm -hmm. I think it's favorable to use first and second order. Yeah, and, and if it doesn't add any complexity to the reconstruction, then that's that's the only yeah, only th issue. that's a nice thing. You know, we use the same reconstruction mm -hmm. for, for each one. I mean, yeah, it was only on the sequence side that we had to make any modifications. Cool. All right. Well, I, I think uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. I would, uh, I would just thank Eric again for taking his time in this in this afternoon to uh, to take us through this this work again. And if anyone else will be in in Amsterdam, we'll get to see each other again next week. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Bye. Bye.